All right, welcome back to the next part of my recap of what has gone before in our Vampire the Masquerade Chronicle. Uh, in this video, we have gotten to Season 2. So, between Season 1 and 2, there was uh, sort of a downtime of a couple of years, not that long. But during that time period, the group pretty much got together full-time. What happened was the Bard got tired of the dangers of traveling on the road and decided to put down roots in Bistritz with Dragomir and Gabriel. Uh, and there he started, that's when he began studying the art of medicine. Svezdan decided that he didn't much care for the monastery where he was being uh, abused by his sibling, and he ran off. Not too long after uh, arriving in Bistritz, however, he met another fellow who sort of became a mentor to him and began teaching him the art of abyss mysticism. This mentor kind of purposely kept himself very mysterious. He didn't really tell Svezdan anything or why Svezdan was of interest to him even. And so there's still, the players still aren't really sure what his motivations are. Svezdan, having taken the flaw over confidence, never looked a uh, gift horse in the mouth and just took the abyss mysticism and didn't bother wondering why. The story of Season 2 really began when the call began to go out for soldiers to participate in the Fourth Crusade. The player characters had already missed the first three, but they uh, decided to take the opportunity to try and accumulate some wealth and power for themselves on this crusade. They started off heading to uh, Venice, where the city, the city where the Crusaders were meeting up, and there they began to get involved with the debate as to where the crusade would go. This is the first uh, really major political event that the uh, Coterie was party to, aside from the meeting of the uh, Zemitsi Voyevodes in Season 1. Svezdan immediately started trying to get in good with Narses, the Prince of Venice, and uh, even agreed to join the Cainite Heresy, although that... This is where the story gets complicated, when we get into Svezdan's various plots and betrayals, and even I'm not really completely sure who he's working for. But his mentor who taught him the Abyss Mysticism heavily implied that Svezdan might be considered for membership in some organization, and he took that to mean the uh, Amicus Noctis, or the Friends of the Night, which is the ruling group of Clan La Sombra. So he agreed to join them, and then he sort of implied that Svezdan might want to join the Canite Heresy to try and go undercover with them. Because they, because he suspected that they were in fact working with the Inkanu, who he really wanted to go undercover with, but he was using the Canite Heresy as a means to, it was really very complicated. Point is, he joined the Canite Heresy, and he didn't actually join them. So, while there, they tried to convince everyone that the Crusade ought to go to Egypt to just take that, hold it, and then try and trade it back for Jerusalem, but no one else really seemed to see it that way. While there, they also discovered that the followers of Set were trying to derail the crusade for some reason, although they didn't really find out why. Once that was done, they did succeed in infiltrating the Canite heresy, and the crusade pretty much took off without too much of their input. Other important events that happened was they did witness, uh, they did first meet the famous hunter uh, Gauthier de Dampierre, who turned out to be a reoccurring villain throughout the uh, next couple seasons. Other than that, not much happened, so they started making their progress towards Constantinople, where the crusade was headed first to proceed into the Holy Land. And I guess if you know anything about crusader history, you can tell where this is going, but uh, if not, I'll uh, save that spoiler for a little bit later. On the way, they got caught up in a little bit of a feud between some Zemitsi, and there they first really got to spend a lot of time with Micah Vykos. Uh, Micah Vykos is a reoccurring character. He's a signature character uh, for Clan Zemitsi in the overall meta plot. And uh, if you read through a lot of meta plot material, Micah Vykos is really the main character of Vampire the Masquerade. Uh, he turns up pretty much everywhere. He's kind of the most important guy around, although he's usually portrayed as a villain most of the times official adventures introduce him. The players uh, took it upon themselves to make friends with him, uh, and he just kind of showed up throughout season one, kind of mysteriously, sort of 
possibly manipulating events, although it was never really clear. Uh, he was involved here, since he's from Constantinople. So, he and the players tried to get involved in this Zemitsi feud, and they ended up siding with one of the sides and wiping out the other. And they uh, used this opportunity to try and get in good with Micah, although they just ended up owing him, I think, two life boons? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was two. Through various situations where they uh, left themselves in mortal peril, and Micah Vikos took advantage of the situation and rescued them. I'm not sure what exactly the players are up to now, but suffice to say they owe him quite a lot. They're pretty much in permanent debt to Micah Vikos. Which is, uh, interesting. I'm sure those of you more familiar with the setting can probably tell that might not be a good thing, but... Eventually the players did reach Constantinople. They moved ahead of the actual army itself and got there actually a couple years before the Crusader army would arrive, because moving armies in the Dark Ages took a very long time. So, I took the opportunity to run several sort of minor adventures from the Constantinople by Night book. Uh, just sort of very basic political machination sort of plots. Uh, the characters are still neonates at this point, so I thought I'd take advantage of trying to do some more small-scale stuff while I still, while their power levels were still sort of appropriate to that. And really just try and get them introduced to the setting and maybe sort of establish some ties in Constantinople. Because originally their intent was pretty much just to loot it and just steal whatever they could while they were there. But by the end, they actually ended up establishing some ties in Constantinople, and by the time the army arrived, they had decided that they needed to try and save it. Which, uh, was, uh, I guess easier said than done. So, when the army arrived, spoiler, I guess, for history, uh, the Fourth Crusade pretty much reaches Constantinople, the Crusader army sacks it, destroys pretty much everything there, and then they just take off. They never even get to anywhere near the Holy Land. Constantinople itself was ruled by a Methuselah named Michael, who's a Toreador Methuselah. During their time in Constantinople, Svezdan had become sort of friends with Michael, actually. Something about him had reminded Michael of an old lover, so they had sort of kept up a sort of correspondence during their time there. By that, I mean Michael just kept sending weird visions to Svezdan. So, when the uh, shit hit the fan so to speak, and the Crusader army started sacking the city, they uh, immediately went about their work trying to find out where Michael was hidden and try and save him. They also got roped into a plot of Micah Vykos's to steal, uh, not to steal, but rather to kill one of his rivals, which they did do because they didn't really have a choice with as many boons as they owed him by that point. And they also uh, did eventually find Michael, but then discovered that because he had been driven insane by years of torpor and various other supernatural methods being used against him, uh, Michael had become suicidal, so he was going to allow someone to diablerize him. And at first, that was going to be a Bali woman that he had uh, had an encounter with several centuries before. However, the players put a stop to that at the final moment and decapitated her. With her gone, uh, Michael then uh, chose Svezdan to try and diablerize him, and it was at this point that Svezdan decided to hell with true faith he wanted to diablerize Methuselah. It did work. He did diablerize him successfully. He lost his true faith, and uh, some remnant of Michael was left inside him, which has plagued Svezdan for some time after this. With that done, with Michael destroyed, there's really no way to stop the sack of the city, and it is pretty much reduced to rubble. And that was really where Season 2 ended. The Crusade disbanded, and everyone went back home, essentially. They did find out some information while they were there as to the Inkanu. They found a couple of canines who they believed to be involved in the situation, and they passed that information on to David's contact in exchange for some more abyss mysticism on his part. And that's really it. They remained, unlike the rest of the Crusaders, they decided to remain in Constantinople because they kind of gotten sick of Radu sending them on various suicide missions. And they hoped that by staying in another city, they could establish their own power base there. 
through their political machinations and his position in the Kenai heresy, uh, Svezdan was able to establish himself as Senshal of the new Constantinople government, and everyone else found their own positions there as well. So that's really the story of season two. After that, they stayed there for several years, and that was just uh, downtime. Basically, I took the stories of this from both Constantinople by Night and the adventure Bitter Crusade. So I'll take this opportunity to give a small review of those. Bitter Crusade I actually really like. Um, it's a short chronicle. It's not like uh, the Transylvania Chronicles or the Giovanni Chronicles, which span four books. It's the same basic idea, but there are three adventures that are all linked together in an overall story together in one book, which I think is really a great way to handle it. I don't like it so much just the one adventure on its own, because there are a lot of adventures like that. Um, I'm thinking specifically of stuff like Clash of Wills or um, Founds of Bright Crimson. We'll get to those adventures and I'll give my reviews of those later, but the three stories that all link together I think works really well. It takes the Dark Ages setting forward from 1197 to 1204. That was kind of the basis of it. And it works really well. It's based around the Crusade meets up in Venice. That's story one. On the way, you get involved in, like, a Zamitsi feud. That's the second story. That's almost the one I would say didn't really fit. And you'll notice I kind of skipped over it when I was telling the story. There's really not that much interesting that happens in it. Uh, aside that just Micah Vikos is there, and he, as a character, is just really important. But this adventure itself is really not, in my opinion. Uh, it's the one you could most easily live at, uh, leave out. I think actually a couple of the players missed that day, so I really just, I was almost really going to leave it out, but because some people weren't there, I, I just kind of had the part of the party that was there, they went out on this separate side quest with Micah, because he just asked them to come with him. And it was just almost a way to really stall the plot until everyone would be back together again. <laughs> really, and that's the most useful thing for this adventure. The last one uh, deals with Constantinople being sacked, which is really an important event, and it does give you the opportunity to Diablerize Methuselah, which some players would be excited about. Yeah, I like, I like it also when you have the opportunity to do stuff like that that can really have a major impact on a character, and really the setting in general. So one of the things I thought was most important, I mentioned in Season 1 that I wanted to give the players the opportunity to diverge from World of Darkness canon, or real world canon, I guess. I just like it when players can have some influence on what's going on in the world around them. So, Constantinople, so Bitter Crusade I would definitely recommend, and I really wish they had actually put out more books like this, because this is sort of, this is one of the reasons why I say I like the meta plot, because this really advances the meta plot, but it does it in a way where it's an adventure, your players do have some impact on what goes on, and they can really, there are major events going on, but your players have a chance to kind of shape how they turn out. And I know a lot of times when people complain about the meta plot, it's that things are just kind of moving along and you don't really have any input on it. I feel like that's kind of a dumb complaint because as a storyteller, you can pick what you do want to use and don't. And with adventures like this, your players can have some impact on it too, which I think is also important. Uh, less of a glowing review for Constantinople by Night. It's really just a city source book that happens to take place in the Dark Ages. And that's it. There's not that much really that interesting here. Um, if you're gonna do a adventure in Constantinople, maybe pick it up. But other than that, it's not that interesting. If you're gonna run Bitter Crusade, you do not need to dip Constantinople by Night. Um, if you're going to do, I said before, if you want to do Transylvania Chronicles, you need to pick up Transylvania by Night too. really. Uh, I really don't feel the same way about this. If you're going to do Constantinople by Night, though, I think you really do need to pick up Bitter Crusade, because Bitter Crusade really ends the story that started here. It gives sort of a concrete ending to the city kind of being destroyed. Because a lot of the themes of Constantinople by Night is that the city is kind of doomed, so, Bitter Crusade kind of gives your players a chance to try and save it, you know, uh, just participate in its destruction, whatever they want to do. I don't think there's too much else to say here, really. Yeah, definitely, if you're going to run a Dark Ages game, think about picking up Bitter Crusade. I would recommend it pretty heavily. The first two, the first story and the last story are pretty good. Gives a chance for Micah Vikos. 
you know, I... To be fair, maybe I make a bigger deal of Micah Vikos than he is. I really like the character, so I bring him up a lot whenever I can, and when I see official adventures with him in it. And he is in all of them, essentially. I always like it. Uh, I don't think there's too much else to say. So yeah, when we pick up again, it will be in Season 3, and we can discuss what goes on in that one. So I will see you guys in that part. Uh, and there he start. That's when he began studying the art of medicine. Svezdan decided that he didn't much care for the monastery where he was being uh, abused by his sibling, and he ran off. Not too long after uh, arriving in Bistritz, however, he met another fellow who sort of of a couple of years, not that long. But during that time period, the group pretty much got together full time. What happened was the bard got tired of the dangers of traveling on the road and decided to put down roots in Bistritz with Dragomir and Gabriel. Alright, welcome back to the next part of my recap of what has gone before in our Vampire the Masquerade Chronicle. Uh, in this video, we have gotten to Season 2. So, between Season 1 and 2, there was uh, sort of a downtime, well, Players still aren't really sure what his motivations are. Svezdan, having taken the flaw overconfidence, never looked a uh, gift horse in the mouth and just took the abyss mysticism and didn't bother wondering why. The story of Season 2 really began when the Call began to become a mentor to him and began teaching him the art of abyss mysticism. This mentor kind of purposely kept himself very mysterious. He didn't really tell... Svezdan anything or why Svezdan was of interest to him even. And so there's still